Welcome to the Relationship Recovery Podcast, hosted by Jessica Knight, a certified life coach who specializes in narcissistic and emotional abuse. This podcast is intended to help you identify manipulative and abusive behavior, set boundaries with yourself and others, and heal the relationship with yourself so you can learn to love in a healthy way. Hello, and thank you for being here today. Before we dive into the interview today, I just want to express an immense amount of gratitude for the people that continuously email me and let me know that my podcast is helping you move through abuse in your life and essentially change your life. That means so much to me because that's exactly where I once was. I was either listening to podcasts, listening to audiobooks, reading audiobooks, going on Reddit threads, going down the rabbit hole of Quora. And the purpose of it was so that I was able to understand that I wasn't alone, that people have been here before, and that my thoughts weren't crazy. They may not have made much sense to me, but they absolutely weren't crazy. And I wasn't crazy. What I was going through was crazy. I've been receiving more and more emails, and I'm just so grateful to hear from you. It really means a lot to me. I use an email address that's not connected to my website. It's Jessica at jessicanightcoaching.com. The purpose of that is so if you email me and somebody has an eye on your emails that, you know, something with an at emotional abuse coach doesn't come up. So I say that to just basically say, thank you, continue to reach out. And if you need anything, or if there's a topic that you ever want covered, you absolutely can ask me. I have two courses that are available on my website, the relationship recovery course, which helps you identify, understand, and begin to heal from abuse. It's kind of like a starter course if you're just starting to understand that you're in an emotionally abusive relationship. And the Boundaries Deep Dive, which helps you learn how to set boundaries with an emotionally abusive or narcissistic partner that may actually work. Spoiler alert, it's incredibly hard. And they all result in you being incredibly brave and powerful. But both of those are there if you need some help right now. You also know how to find me, emotionalabusecoach.com, where I have consistent one-on-one coaching and I have one-off one-on-one coaching, which is called a validation call. I'm going to pause there and explain a little bit about this episode and who I'm talking to today. Today, Ben Taylor returns and I'm really excited to speak with him. Ben and I are going to talk through Christianity and narcissism and if a narcissist can be a true Christian and how some scripture and teachings are misinterpreted to promote abuse. This is a topic that I went into this call extremely excited about. And when him and I initially talked about this topic, I felt very ready and wanting to just dissect this monster of a topic. And then I realized there is so much that I don't know. I talk about my story quickly in the episode. I just kind of go over my relationship to religion. For those of you who don't know me, this is your first interaction to me. There's a lot more in there, but long story short, I wasn't raised religious. I actually grew up not really understanding religion. I was in a relationship with somebody in my early 20s that meant a lot to me. He meant a ton to me. He still does. I still see him with a lot of respect, even though we haven't had contact in years, but he was psychologically abused by his family and was basically told that he could not marry me because I wasn't Jewish. And so as a 20 year old, 20 something year old from Queens, New York, living in Manhattan, who felt, eh, anything's really possible. I didn't really understand that that was so deep seated. It was so insidious and that the person that I was with was never going to be able to get out of it or to be able to really stand up to his family. And I didn't name it as abuse at the time. I, we had a very long relationship. I considered converting, but the fact of the matter is I was never going to be born a Jew. That's the truth. Like I couldn't go back into the womb and pop out. And I never would have been good enough. And the rules that were put on me 
were much different than the rules put on him. And like I said, the fact of the matter is, is that it never would have been accepted and the abuse would have increased. And every time we thought that we were kind of getting through to his family or that we were turning a new page, the abuse increased. It got worse. That was my only introduction to religion. Um, my family or my grandmother specifically said she was a Catholic, but what that really meant was she went to church a few times a year. And I don't really know what it meant past that. When I was in college, I dabbled in Buddhism a little bit because I liked the idea that we could look at ourselves. There are parts of us to heal that we can actually begin to listen to ourselves. And you'll hear in the episode that that's completely the opposite of Ben's experience. Ben was raised in a religious home. Faith was very important, is very important to him. And we go through a lot of the complexities. I lay this out for you now just to really kind of just lay out that like I had such a different perspective. But when I work with people that are faith-based, that have strong faith ties, the way that I approach it and the way I've always seen it is that there's this other part of you that is very important. It's a large voice. You know, often we have the voice of society in the back of our head. When faith is there, that might be another voice. Our family could be a large voice. It's important to us. And I can honor that and I can appreciate that. Even though I might not be a practicing Christian or practicing anything, my daughter's voice is extremely important to me. She might be six, but she is the biggest motivator that I have. I make decisions based on what is best for my daughter. I feel like I live for her a lot of the time. And so as we get into this episode, you might find or you might think like, wow, Jessica might sound ignorant here. If I do, I do. And if I don't, I don't. But Nothing I say is meant to be insensitive. Nothing I say is meant to really hurt anybody. It's really just to begin to open up this monster of a topic. And I think Ben and I do that here. All of Ben's information is going to be linked in the show notes. If you want to find him and connect with him, you can always go to rawmotivations.com. Ben is a wealth of information. I highly recommend following him. And I know that you will see that through listening to this episode. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope that it's helpful. Okay. Hi, Ben. Thank you for Hello joining there. me again. I'm glad to be back. Yes. So before we dive in on this like very interesting topic, I wanted to give a quick overview or disclaimer on, I guess, my introduction to religion and where I stand, because and today, as we talk about Christianity and narcissism and the intersection of Christianity and narcissism, I just want to name that like some questions that I might ask might come across ignorant. They're not actually they are. They're not insensitive, though. So it's truly ignorant. They're not coming from an insensitive place. This is not a topic that I, I didn't grow up religious in any religion. It wasn't imposed on me. My grandmother would say that she was a Catholic, but that that really didn't mean much, you know, other than church every once in a while when she felt like it. So it is what it is. But that was, that's how I grew up. I grew up in New York where there are so many different religions everywhere and so many sects of different religions everywhere. I never felt the need to go to one. And if I ever did, it would have been something like Buddhism. That being said, I work with a lot of clients that have, they are religious or they are within a church or they have left someone who they, you know, left a partner and they had a shared religion and a shared church. And that has been a very complicated thing and another element of their divorce. So as we go through this, I'm really grateful to have you, Ben, here, who does identify as a Christian. You understand, I think, that, the, like, you know, the threads of narcissism in Christianity, as well as how they show up in abusive relationships to probably keep people inside of relationships. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that we're able to go through some of these ideas and just offer another understanding from someone who is like within the field, you know, you are, you know, you identify as a self-aware narcissist. So that way it's like, we're, they're just shining a light on some of these complex topics. Right. No, absolutely. No, I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to uh, just dive in. Uh, whenever you sent me like the idea and the topic about this podcast, I was like super excited for this episode, just 
Uh, this is something that a lot of times people don't have a clue about. And unfortunately, based on society and man's instituted religion and everything like that, it's become very uh, a very popular way to abuse multiple people everywhere. And yeah. so I'm glad we're able to talk about this. To give you a little background just about myself, my name is Ben Taylor. I'm a self-aware narcissist. And the goal of me being on any type of social media is to first bring awareness to people about narcissism and then help them through their growth, change, uh, healing, and development to be able to help them actually get out of toxic relationships, not be with someone like me and continue to move forward in their healing journey because it is a healing journey. It's not just a quick thing. And through that healing process, it changes to a growth mindset. And that's when we see people glow up and go completely and do amazing things that they never thought they'd be able to accomplish before because they've been beat down so much by the toxic person in their life. So a little bit of background. I grew up in Christianity. I grew up in the church. My dad was a pastor. Then he was an evangelist. Then he was a pastor. And then he was a missionary. So he's been in ministry for years and years and years. And so growing up in the church, there is a piece of that that I recognize now that contributed to part of my two different versions, my two different masks in one sense yeah. of the the public version and then the private version and the one that I wouldn't show. Part of that was because growing up, we traveled from church to church. I grew up in evangelism. So every week we were leaving a church and going to another church. So no really like permanent ties to anybody, no really like long-term friendships, but just constant move from one place to another regardless of you know what life might be bringing at us in that moment we still had to show up we still had to you know lack of better words perform you know do the stuff that we said we were going to do when we go to that location mm -hmm. um and you know that just kept going kept going kept going and so there's been a lot of my journey that has been in christianity but it really just showed me this is what i have to do to conform this is what i have to do to hide and to blend in and i blended in really well like the mask that I had, the version of myself that I was at that period of time, like blended in really well with a lot of Christianity to make it look like I was this great person. Can but you paint a picture what that looks like? Like what yeah. that looked like for the outside world? So this is the public you. Yeah. So the public me growing up was involved in the ministry. I would sing. I would help with, you know, teaching different classes. I would run vacation Bible schools. Going into like high school, I would be like different like youth leaders and stuff like that. Going into college, I was ran like two ministry teams, like a martial arts demo team, and then also a master's men. It was a preaching and like a ministry team where we'd preach and we'd sing and we'd go to different churches. Kind of the same thing I grew up doing. And all that stuff looks really great on the outside. And then even getting with leaving out of college, getting into business and meeting my wife, there wasn't as much ministry piece there, but there was still like the image, you know, I was involved mm -hmm. in a church plant. I was still like a leader in the the church community and like the business community, all that kind of stuff is like, I was still putting on that front. And so it looked good to everybody else. And then what was the difference between the public life that was out in the world and then the private life that was coming home? Yeah. So the public life that I just kind of mentioned like towards yeah. the end of like being in business, you know, being in the church and stuff like that. And then coming home was the idea of devaluing my wife, of not really mm -hmm. caring uh, about her feelings, about her emotions, and then ultimately getting to the place of gaslighting her through multiple different affairs. So over the course of about eight years, there's about five different affairs that happened. And that was all at the same time while still keeping that public image, while still being a leader in the workplace, while still showing up to Sunday church, uh, while still giving other people advice about their relationships or their marriages, even though there was the same exact stuff that I was doing that was destroying my own. And so today you posted something on Instagram that said, you see, I was claiming to be a Christian. I was claiming to know God while I was still cheating on my wife. And then a few lines later, you say, I look back and say, I was not a Christian because I didn't demonstrate it. Mm -hmm. And so that like basically says like the public you, you know, the mass mm -hmm. number one was not, it obviously was not the same as the private you, but you were showing up so uh, like great in the world to be like, you know, to help other people with their relationships, to promote Christianity. When you wrote that today, the first question that came up for me was what would have been good Christian values in this sense? So when we look at the cheating, or because I think that this comes up a lot, I've heard this a lot in, you know, I guess in with my client base is like, there will be an affair, but the person will have all these justifications on why it was okay. And I don't. That's the problem right there. 
Yeah. And like I that's the first and foremost like, problem. Though. Yeah. I don't hear you doing that. Um, but I'm curious, mm-hmm. like when it relates to like w- relates to religion or re- relates to Christianity, because I'm sure you had justifications that had to do with like your religion and why there's like reasoning why it was okay. I'm sure I'm curious just for our listeners if they if you can unpack that a little bit. I'd unpack it in like twofold, I guess. Like the first yeah. aspect is like with a narcissist, there doesn't have to be a justification. The justification is just after the the exposure or after something's been caught. So like in the moment, I wasn't going out and cheating and then being like, oh, I'm I'm still a Christian. I, it, there wasn't even a thought. It was like, this is a different reality. Like this is a different piece of me that doesn't really have to conform to these rules or doesn't have to conform to this aspect. Now, at the same time, because I'm going to say it like both sides of my mouth in one sense, at the same time, there's this aspect of trying to convince everybody else that I'm a good person. That also is a lot easier to do if you're also convincing yourself that you're a good person. So because I show up, because I do these things, and this is this is the fallacy you see with Christianity and you also see and, and Christianity, what I'm talking about is like the organized religion, like the the stuff yeah. that people say is Christianity, not like a relationship with God. There's a big, giant difference that a lot of people don't realize. But what I was doing is putting one version of myself forward, having a different version, but trying to convince other people and then trying to convince myself at times that I was the good person. And that is the whole aspect that you see in society and in Christianity of I show up right? Like I pay the bills, I come home, I give my wife and my daughter like a roof over the head. So they should be grateful, right? Like that's the whole aspect that's so asinine in nature that a narcissist and that I had of like, I did my part, like I show up, like, why would they expect more? Like, that's how ridiculous it is. And seeing that in my own life. And now sometimes when I talk to clients, and they're talking about how they see that in, in their husband and in the stuff that's happening there, or I've talked to sometimes narcissists, and like, I'll just call them out flat out. I'm like, we could get a trained monkey to do that. But like, you're mm-hmm. not actually providing anything at all, you know, for the relationship. But that's where I was at. You know, I wasn't providing, but I was, you know, saying, okay, this is, you know, this is good enough. And at the same time, switching it around. So I was the victim, you know, well, my wife doesn't understand. Me. She doesn't give me the support I need. She's not, you know, good enough in that aspect. Like she doesn't actually love me or care about me. Like I'm just misunderstood. We just have a communication issue. Let me just talk to someone else. And it just keeps spiraling from there. Yeah. That's so interesting. I love how you framed it with like, well, I, I'm showing up. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Like, mm-hmm. because then if you go back to church, right, you talk to some people in your community about like, I'm doing all these things. She doesn't seem to appreciate it. It doesn't talk. It talks. It's all on the actions and not really how you're like, how you're engaging with her. It's like, mm-hmm. she should, it's like this expectation. Right. And, does the church it's, it's the like Bible. it's like saying it's like saying like I put gas in the car for 20 years it should still drive I didn't do any maintenance I didn't change yeah. the tires yeah. I didn't like put oil in it I didn't actually put it into service I just put gas in it why isn't it doing what I want it to do because I wasn't actually caring for it at all yeah and then it breaks down and then you're mad you right. know and it's like exactly. it, should, it should right exactly that entitlement piece 100 percent. what are expectations within a marriage that are promoted by the church hmm promoted currently as far as like the skewed up version of it <laughs> yeah like like the unhealthy promotion so for example yeah no, no absolutely that you can't get divorced mm-hmm. you know and that's like probably a big one but i'm sure there's like there's i mean well the, the bigger one is sex as a duty but i think we should probably like talk that one a little bit later in yeah. the podcast but i mean i'm sure there are expectations within how people relate to each other that i'm unaware of but i also think that there's very clearly like you know that once you get married you're bound and you can't mm-hmm. get divorced. So yeah, I, I, I would say like those two are really giant ones for sure. Yeah. That's pushed by like mainstream Christianity. Um, and that we see a lot of times. Uh, I think another version would be, so there's even a book about it too, that kind of like mushrooms some of the thought process of like love and respect. And, you know, men deserve respect and they're supposed to give love. And really what happened with a lot of Christianity is they just kind of took that book and that concept and they used it to beat a bunch of women and say, you're just supposed to respect your husband, even if they don't love you. It doesn't matter. You're just supposed to respect just as blind respect. That's just like a bunch of bullshit that like at the end of the day, like, like there's no reason why this person should respect someone who's treating them so awful. But the church oftentimes is like, well, you need to respect. And then that promotes the second thing that I would say. So I guess really four main things that we're talking about. But the the second one that I would say, which is this concept of not just respect, but then of responsibility, 
which mm-hmm. is really screwed up because it really damages a lot of people in an abusive relationship is when the church and religious organizations start to show and start to declare overtly and covertly that it's the woman's fault for the man's cowardice and lack of being a man and immaturity and willingness to go cheat. And that gets pushed a lot of times by the church. And I'll give an example. When we went to our first couple's counselor, biblical, newthetic counseling, church recommended, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. We went to this person after the first affair. The first affair, I got to the place where I confessed it. I was like, I was seeing a loop. I was seeing a cycle, seeing it disintegrate on both sides. I confessed it, brought it to the pastor first. The church tried to run me out of the church. It was this whole ordeal. Wife fought for me, parents fought for me, then was left with no support. And, and anyways, so then we went to couples counseling, went to this Christian couples counselor, and he used a phrase, which I I really hate the phrase, but there's like a fragment that's true, but not in this type of relationship. And that's the problem. He used the phrase of like, you didn't make it easy for him not to sin. And mm. basically what it did is it started to put this story in part, started to put this blame on her that she is the reason why I cheated, which is a lie, which is a bunch of BS. And the, and the problem with that is a lot of Christianity is like, well, if you would have loved him better, then he wouldn't have cheated. If you would have done this better, then he wouldn't have done this. If you would have communicated more, then he wouldn't have talked to other women. And that's a complete lie. And a lot of times when I talk to people and we're talking about narcissism and narcissistic abuse, I have to tell them, I was like, nothing you did caused them to do that. That was their own choice. My wife had to get to the place in her counseling. And she talks about this in our podcast that we've recorded together where the therapist finally like asked her, she was like, you didn't put a gun to his head and tell him to go cheat on you. Like you did not force him to do that. That was his own decision. And the problem is a lot of Christianity is pushing that overtly and covertly to other people, making people feel like it's their fault that the other person cheated on them. Yeah, that's huge. I love, and you didn't make it easy for him not to sin, puts all the responsibility and the blame on her. It's basically like mm-hmm. narcissism at work, right? It's like, right. it's you. And yeah. it's hard because it's, it's what's frustrating is there's Christianity and pieces like that that are taking a phrase like that, which has a portion of truth to it, and they're using it in a manipulative way in that abusive relationship that is completely awful and completely like wrecks and further destroys the partner who's been cheated on, destroys like their self-esteem, their self-worth, their sense of security, like their confidence, all this kind of stuff, because then like, well, it must be my fault. You know, yeah. I did everything right, but it still must be my fault. And that's just completely untrue. And so it's really frustrating to hear stuff like that. And so that was something that early on in our relationship that damaged it even more, but also even kind of made her stuck a little bit more because she thought at that point, well, I guess it's my fault that he cheated. So I just need to be a better wife. Yeah. And I could see how that would also work in situations of like anger and abuse, like verbal abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, like of like, well, you didn't make it easy for him not to yell. You didn't make it easy for him not to throw that, to like punch that wall or to punch you. Like, you know, maybe like, were you being respectful? You know, things like that, it's just like, it's like, it puts all the responsibility on the victim and not any responsibility on the person who's making the decision through, you know, through like a very, like I said, like, I don't have the background and like that allegiance to a church, but from the, either like the people I've dated or, and this sounds like exactly like in your situation that like the church was a very loud, like voice in your head that was very important. Right. And so the same mm-hmm. for your wife. So if somebody's from the church is saying you didn't make it easy not to sin, she's definitely going to internalize that mm-hmm. and feel deep, deep, deep sense of shame. Right. Yeah. Very much so. And so we touched on this and I think it'd, it'd be important just to touch on sex now that we're here around the expectations, the respect, the responsibility. Um, I had an amazing conversation with Nat, who has the Instagram profile and TikTok uh, mending me. She talks a lot about sexual coercion. Mm-hmm. And she sent this over to me. It's part of the scripture. It says, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with the consent for a time that you may give yourselves a fasting and prayer to come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of Mm self-control. And that one is typically used, and I've seen this, you know, before Nat to basically imply 
sex is a duty to each other. So regardless of what is happening, you know, and usually it's like the man on the, like, you know, a man saying this to a woman, it's like, that's her duty. She needs to do that. It's her, she can't, she doesn't have choice. If she's not being respected, loved and cared for, she still has a duty to have sex. Right. How do you see that? How do you see like sexual control within the church? Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to go off the verse a little bit first, because I think that's important just to kind of like walk yeah. through that. I think the the framework is, is people normally get confused by it and they normally misinterpret and try to twist it for their own means. So what I mean that is the church wants to twist it by their own means to get conformity so that the church looks better. If there's less divorces in the church, then the church looks great. You know, like it's it's doing the work of God because it's matching up all the stuff and everybody looks like they have a perfect mar- marriage and a perfect relationship. This is why when you go into most churches, they're not actually willing to talk about the shit that's actually going on because it's not. It's all superficial. It's all fake. It's all, you know, hey, let's let's love each other. Let's let's have this like nice, great experience. But no one actually brings up the crappy stuff that they're going through. It's all hidden under a mask that a lot of times they have to make it look better. So in this regard, the whole framework that this verse is referring back to is like the the relationship being like mutual, like it working together. It's not that one person is coercive or controlling another person, but it's actually working together. Both people are supposed to be like working together. And when you're in a narcissistic relationship, the part that's confusing is one partner says, he says that he's working on it, but he's doing the exact opposite. It's a mask, but then they're doing the exact opposite. And so you have to be able to determine what is actually true and be like, wait a second, this person isn't even working on it. The one thing that's like, Interesting is like the two verses you read. The second one is that aspect of like, don't deprive another, another except by agreement, limited time, blah, blah. And really what I would say is I would flip that verse to be some of the aspect about sexual coercion, because what's actually happening is the person is coercing the other person to give them what they want. And they're using this verse saying, well, you shouldn't deprive me. At the same time, while they're being abusive and while the other person's body is shutting down because they're not actually giving them a safe place and love, which is part of the framework of what marriage is supposed to be before it even gets to this. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It goes right back to where we just were about like, you know, having respect, having responsibilities, that idea of like, I showed up while I'm here, you Mm -hmm. know, so all these expectations must be met. And if you're watching that happen in your relationship and all the relationships around you in your community and the community that you trust, you know, in a community that you're telling yourself, like, this is a church, these are good people, but everybody does this and is acting this way. I just, it feels like institutional gaslighting. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I imagine myself being in like in the middle of a church and like listening to some of these conversations of, you know, being like, well, you know, like it's just, things have been pretty bad for a while, but you know, uh, it will come, it will come around, you know, and we're, we're, Right. We're working on it. It's like, I think my head would just like explode because I'm just like, we can't do that. And I think it just becomes so dangerous when everyone is like viewing things the same. And I know that not every single person views all of this exactly like this, but I think when it gets into narcissistic relationships, abusive relationships, a lot of these themes sound exactly the same mm-hmm. and it's really damaging. And it's hard to find. I think my biggest thing with churches, is it's hard to find a church that's honest. That's, that's what really, I was thinking really, when you were talking. Like, uh, I mean, it, it yeah. pisses me off. I sent an email out, I guess it was like a week or two ago about it. Like it just really like we're, we've moved. And so we're trying to find, you know, just people to get connected to. And it's been so frustrating. We went to one that we almost walked out of, except we had free childcare because our Sophia was in the nursery. But like, well, but we were like sitting through it and it was so stupid because the guy got up and he talked about all their programs and not the person. And so I'm yeah. like, well, what's the point? Like, there's no point of even being here. Give, give you a, a quick example. The first, the first um, affair that I confessed brought to the brought to the pastor of the church, went through this whole thing. They tried to kick me out of the church. They tried to push this. And I'm like repentant at that time. I'm just like, I don't even know like what's wrong with me. I don't even know what's going on. I had no clue what that goes in. Didn't even have an idea about narcissism, like knew nothing about anything at that point. I mean, this is many years ago and was just like, I don't even know. That whole thing bonded Kayla and me together more because we were fighting against them because I was fighting to try to figure out what was going on. Never found the answers. Give you a different idea. Our church family in Virginia is where I actually confessed when all this stuff came out. Not that I got caught. I came to a confession place and I said like, hey, this is what it is. 
I sat down with the pastor, with one of the pastors there, and I was like, hey, this is what happened. I walked into that extremely like afraid and like mm-hmm. scared because of what had happened in the previous church. And the difference was like night and day. Like the thing was like, he accepted me and he loved me and he cared for me and he supported me. And we met like weekly for like months and months, like being there for me through trying to figure out all the stuff that I was going through, connected me with a therapist, like so many different things, but it was completely night and day. And there wasn't like, I don't need to hide. I don't need to have a different mask. I don't need to have a different version of myself to him because he was willing to accept me for how I was, which is, is ultimately like showing like true love, which I think is like really cool. And then now we're trying to look for a new church and stuff like that because we've moved. And it's just like, there's no one that is like actually being honest. And that's the biggest thing that is a problem in Christianity and our society in our world today is people don't want to actually be honest and be truthful with what they're dealing with and what's actually going on. You touched on something that was important of like confession and the idea of like repent. And this is one of those questions where I think that I, you know, might sound ignorant, but in the church, if you were to confess, like you said, to like to the second pastor that understood and like cared, like that sounds so supportive. Mm-hmm. I always imagine that there would be confessions where you confess and it's basically like, okay, you know, they're basically like, you know, you're, you know, I'm sure they would get into talking about like how you could repent for that, but then it kind of goes away in some way mm-hmm. and you don't actually deal with it. Does that come up? Yeah, that's typically, I think, with a lot of more of the fake churches that don't want to deal with it or that are are ill-equipped to deal with it, which would be the majority of churches when we talk about narcissism as a niche in particular. I think the majority of churches, uh, Christian counselors, things like that, have no clue what they're doing. And as a result, it have no clue what they're doing with narcissism. Now, it's a great place like if they want to work on their marriage and communication and there's no toxicity involved, just, you know, pride and like other things like that. Like, yeah, go for it. But like when you're dealing with like narcissism, like your only thing I've seen in Christianity and Christian counselors a lot of times and dealing with couples counseling, narcissists, stuff like that, is it just further drives the abuse. Yeah, I think that's an important point. When you were talking earlier about the first, you know, kind of like counselor that you went to that sound that sound like it was a church couples counselor is that right it wasn't necessarily exactly in that particular church but he was associated he was practicing like uh it was called biblical like newthetic counseling okay. um where like everything stems back to the bible which there's a point of that i agree but then there's also an aspect of like him him getting to the place of convincing kayla you know covertly in one sense of hey it's your fault that he cheated you know that's where i'm like no it doesn't actually say that yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that you've talked about this before in your content or on your podcast that, you know, couples therapy with a narcissist who's not self-aware and working on themselves is a uh, hell, you know, it's, it's right. absolutely pointless. Um, oh, just absolutely. Because, I actually have a video coming out about that like here shortly. Yeah. Can you actually touch on it quickly? Because I think it's just important to remind people that like, if they didn't listen to the other podcast that you and I did together, that will be linked in the show notes so you can go listen to it. But, you know, you are extremely self-aware and you say in the other podcast that you talk like you were had to work on yourself, like, and that it's a continuous thing and that you do it every day. And it's like, and you probably will do it forever. And it's, mm-hmm. it's not something that it's like, it's on a very extremely tight leash. And that, that's what enabled you to be able to change is like, you know, your willingness and awareness that is not 99.9% of the people. So if you could just touch on just for a minute, what like couples therapists, couples therapy with a narcissist is like before we move on, I think that would be really helpful for someone who's sitting here like, okay, well, maybe we can get into couples therapy. I just want to give that reminder. Yeah. So let's put a couple of things in front of it really quick. First off, if the narcissist in your life is unwilling to be honest, vulnerable, or show consistent change, then you need to walk away because there's nothing there you can actually build a relationship on. Two, if the narcissist is unwilling to go to their own individual therapy, let's say if you've been with a narcissist five years, then they should go to that therapist for about a year, nine months to a year before you ever consider couples counseling, because you want to actually see if they actually mean it. And if they're also going to be honest, vulnerable and show consistent change, here's a tool to do that. If they're not doing that, then don't do couples counseling either. The other thing is like, so when you go into a couples counseling, couples therapy session, you get to the place where you walk in the door and you sit down, you look over and the guy that's sitting over there is looking back at you with a completely different mask. And so the therapist is being like, oh, you've got a communication issue. You guys have an unresolved conflict problem or you know, a deep-seated root of something that we have to work through. 
and doesn't actually see the toxicity for what it actually is because the person that's there is still not being honest. It all goes back to the honesty, the vulnerability, and consistent change. So what happens is you get into a couple session and the therapist oftentimes is gaslit into believing that you're the crazy one. And oftentimes it looks like that in the therapy office because the narcissist is looking so great, it frustrates you and it pisses you off so much that you're the one that looks crazy. Mm -hmm. And they do that to be able to validate the story that they're a good person and that they're the victim and you're the one abusing them, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you can't have a piece of the narcissist that's going to be honest to start off with or is going to do their own therapy to start off with, then couples counseling is a waste of your time, money, and energy and will probably further link you into being in that toxic relationship even longer. Yeah, thank you. That was a great description. Like uh, every time, like sometimes like, you know, when people are describing something, it just reminds me of a, my past life and mm -hmm. just thinking about sitting in therapy. And like, I used to get called out for shutting down, but I was shutting down because I was shell-shocked. Mm -hmm. Like I was absolutely shell-shocked about like the person that was showing up, like, you know, disguised to be my partner. And I'm like, Who, what the, what the hell right. is going on over there? Like, you know, exactly. like, oh, you're this great human, like you've done all these things. And it's like, I haven't slept in 12 years. Like, what is, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah. All right. I'm glad that we had that disclaimer in because I know that's something that people really struggle with. Yeah, I want it's like the same thing with like a narcissist that's also like a drug user and alcoholic. You know, people are like, can they yeah. can they get fixed from the narcissism? I'm like, not if they can't, can't fix from the addiction. Like that's right, exactly. like they have to first have a clear mind. And then the, then after that, then they have to get honest. Then they have to go to honesty 2.0 vulnerability. And mm -hmm. then they have to actually apply it and show consistent change. Like if if there's not a semblance of that, like if there's not that pre-work done, then nothing should ever continue in the relationship. Yeah. Which goes back to like what you were saying about the like, honesty in the church and finding a church that's honest, like finding a church that you feel like, you know, as I think that it sounds like what you're imagining is that you would like to be a part of a church that has these honest and open conversations and that they can be conversations where people can like learn and see themselves in. And it, mm -hmm. it sounds like it's unheard of. I would say a lot of that depth is unheard of in a lot of Christianity and at least to the level that I've experienced it with other people, it's not there. I haven't seen it. Um, I've had way more in-depth and deep conversations with like mentors and, you know, people that I work with, like in just like my process of how I go through stuff and in a group that I'm a part of called um, Wake Up Warrior, like being a part of that has way more in-depth conversations than I've ever had in any church anywhere, because the whole basis of the whole organization is dealing with the truth and is not lying, is not mm -hmm. sedating, is not color coding it or anything like that. And those are the most real conversations I've ever had in my life has been with men inside of that group versus like comparing that to Christianity, religion, and different churches. Nothing ever has come even close. Yeah. I was hoping that we could profile what a spiritual narcissist would look like. Somebody that's going around showing love, professing love, but it's someone who can like twist the scripture around. Just I'm sure you've you know been around some of these individuals in your life. And I'm wondering if you can sort of paint paint that picture, you know, how somebody almost avoids any accountability, blame and shame from using the scripture to their liking, but actually being like a really horrible human in their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a piece of it that you're going to see gets sliced apart really quick when you start to see what's what's said versus what's demonstrated. And when you start to know like the depth of what's going on versus what they're telling you, because a lot of spiritual abuse comes from people telling you one thing and either it hasn't been verified, um, just like, hey, like you're required to give sex to me because we're married or like, like, hey, you're not allowed to get divorced. Like all that stuff was like, okay, well, I'm going to believe that because that's what the religious organization or this person has told me. But then we're not matching up to anything else inside the Bible or inside of how like God actually like loves and, and works with other people in the aspect of how is this actually exemplifying like truth, honesty, love, respect, care, like all that stuff that going into the relationship. So when you have someone who is a, I hate to even use the word spiritual narcissist, and I'll, and I'll leave with a disclaimer after this, so you have an idea of why. But mm -hmm. when you have someone who's like a spiritual narcissist, it's leveraging and twisting words and religion and this conformity aspect to make you do stuff that's not actually what's in the Bible and not actually what's true. And so your body starts to shut down, like things start to change in the relationship, making you unsafe on multiple levels. And with 
this aspect of a spiritual narcissist. It's using that image one way to one people and then a completely different Im- a completely different version in one sense of themselves at home. And really, like the biggest thing I could say is like it all comes down to honesty. And that's yeah. the thing that I would say our entire planet struggles with. And I'll bring it down to a closer group of that's what narcissists struggle with. And that's what survivors struggle with. Everybody does. And that's a piece that a lot of people don't want to hear. A narcissist struggles to be honest because what it reveals about themselves, the shame, the guilt. And as a result, they run over you. They try to avoid it. They do a lot of defensive mechanisms that are extremely abusive and destroying you. A survivor runs away from the truth as well because they don't want to deal with the pain And they're afraid of what's going to happen afterwards. Can they actually get free? Is it actually possible to heal? Is it actually possible to break the trauma bond to be able to move forward? But both are running from the truth. It just looks different. The narcissist has flat out lies. The survivor builds a story in their mind to help life seem a little bit less traumatic so they can get through it. But either way, until the truth is actually exposed, until the truth is actually brought, brought through, there's no hope of healing and there's no hope of change or modification if that truth is that elusive piece. The reason why I don't like this aspect of spiritual narcissists, and I'll take it a step further because I definitely don't like the idea of a Christian narcissist. And the reason why I don't is because I don't think it exists. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't mean that there's not toxic people in religious organizations using that for a toxic means, 100%. There's thousands of people who are getting abused spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, sexually, from a person claiming to be a Christian. The difference is the claim. I don't think it's real. Because if you look at the scripture, and if you look how people are supposed to live when they adhere to, let's say, Christianity, they're supposed to live in a way that's honoring, respectful, loving, caring, like the fruit of the spirit, you know, the positive things in life. And a person can't say that they are a Christian and continue to be an abuser. They can't, ten- they can't continue to say like, hey, I go to church, like I have Jesus in my heart and like all this stuff and still go around and be looking at pornography and cheating on their wife and hitting the other spouse. Like there, there can't be this kind of aspect. And the thing that people don't want to hear and don't want to like look at is like the Bible. So let's use the Bible back to the abusers, right? You know, the, let's mm-hmm. use it this way of um, the, by your fruits, you shall know them. Okay. So if a person says they're a Christian, but they're doing everything in their life that is anti-Christian, that means they're not Christian. And that's the thing that I like, I hate when people like bring up like, oh, like my narcissist was a Christian. I'm just like, bullshit he was. Mm -hmm. Like if he continually cheated on you for 20 years, there is no ounce of him actually being a Christian. And the reason why I say that, why I say this is because think of it this way. I'm going to steal an illustration from a, a preacher a while back. Let's say I am driving to, I'm, I'm driving, let's say I'm driving to meet you for this podcast. Okay. So I'm mm-hmm. driving across the country to meet you for this podcast, get a flat tire. And as I get a flat tire, I get out, it's a busy highway. I'm getting ready to change the tire and the lug nut falls off and rolls into the, the highway without even thinking. I'm just like, crap, I dropped it. I step out. And as I step out, I pick up the lug nut turn and there's like a five ton logging truck that runs me over. At that point, like you're going to tell me like, hey, I think you're like crazy because like you're still here talking to me. There's no way you could have survived that. There's no way that you couldn't have been like greatly impacted by this happening just a few hours ago. And the point that I'm trying to make is a lot of times these quote unquote Christian narcissists will tell people that they have been saved or that they're a Christian or that they are in this Christianity. And the thing is, you can't have a truly interactive, remarkable, and an experience with someone that you claim to be as the God of the universe and not walk away changed. And the people that walk away and they continue the same things over and over again are only further proving that they never even knew who God was to start off with. And they're just lying to themselves and they're lying to everybody else. But you can't have an interaction with God, like a true interaction with God and not walk away impacted. And so the people that say they are and they keep abusing, they're not Christian abusers. They're just abusers. They're just hiding yeah. it with a different mask. Yeah. I don't have their Instagram post in front of me anymore, but I believe you ended that whole, like what you said this morning about you either demonstrate a changed life or you don't. Mm-hmm. Either you, you know, you move forward and you change and you you lean into that, you know, level of honesty, vulnerability, and looking at your own shame, or you don't, and you mm-hmm. just use the scripture to cover up 
your abuse. Right. Exactly. Yeah. The scripture just paints a, a different mask. The uh, Christianity just paints a different mask. Nurses modify their mask for every single person out there. They just hide it different. That's mm-hmm. why that's why I think a lot of times you see um you see a lot of addictions in the church. Uh, you see a lot of addictions in like organized and institutionalized religion, but a lot of times they're hidden because let's say like pornography addiction, like that's a popular one inside of Christianity. My therapist said it to me one time, like the best way ever. And she was like, pornography is the acceptable addiction inside religion because it's hidden. It's not like you see this person high on drugs. You see this person like drinking and on a bender and like they're like an alcoholic. Like you don't see like that kind of stuff because the pornography piece is hidden, but people are addicted to it and they don't actually care because, well, it's something hidden. It's something that I don't have to bring to church with me on Sunday so I can look one way and then I can go do whatever I want the rest of the week. Right. And do you say that because that's like it's an addiction that is normalized in a lot of society? Like, you know, the idea of like, okay, well, people watch porn or my wife gets mad that I watch porn, you know, or something like that. I hear that a lot. And obviously, like, I think that everyone has a different perspective on it. But how is porn (laughs) seen in the church? What's the difference between watching porn and having a porn addiction in the eyes of the church? Well, let's go back for a minute. So I would say in the eyes of scripture of like what's actually there is that the husband has eyes for the wife and the wife has eyes for the husband yeah. not for anybody else but they're actually committed about their relationship there's there's very i would say from what i've seen and from what i've interacted and what i've coached with there's very few relationships that are thriving while still being addicted to pornography or even looking at pornography because it's still pulling attention focus to another direction. It's not actually yeah. investing in that person. It's investing in a screen or investing in themselves really is what it is. And so the church, I, how I was phrasing that is like the church really, it's not even something that's talked about. It's something that's hidden, that's sedated of like, oh, you struggle with that. Yeah, I struggled with that too. And then they go home and they still do it. Like it's it's Got more it. of like, yeah. it's more of like a mass thing of like, I might be addicted to this or I might watch this. And 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 you see this a lot of times with pastors where a pastor will get up and preach about how everybody needs to be pure. And then he's the one that's arrested for like child pornography. Like yeah. this stuff is like common because like it's a mask and it's like, I have to find an outlet for, you know, the stuff that I'm unwilling to actually say, the sedation that I'm putting my life, the, the life that I've been living, that's a mask that I'm actually not being honest with people about what I'm struggling with or what's going on or what's underneath the surface. So as a result, they find an outlet that looks good on the surface, but still is hurting them and the incongruence of who they're portraying themselves to be. Yeah. And, you know, it's almost like I heard another layer of the mask when you were talking of, you know, you downplay what the addiction is when you're just talking to somebody at church. It's like, oh, yeah, I do it too. I had a problem. It's fine. You know, or like, oh, it's every mm-hmm. once in a while. And then you go home. It's actually a real addiction. It's really damaging your relationship. You're not even honest with yourself when you're talking about it anywhere. Right. And I do want to touch on how to leave because I feel and I've worked with people, you know, in that have left relationships and there has been the church involved it's another layer of leaving it's leaving community Mm -hmm. it's leaving friendships especially for the victim that has been blamed and has been told it's her fault and is in a shame spiral i feel like it's extra damaging to Mm -hmm. just have to walk away from also a community friends i mean i still have this one client wonderful young woman i believe she's 28 years old so she's still like she's very young we work together to help her leave her abusive partner who was a pastor and she lost the entire church, which was all of her friends as well. Every wife of every husband, every like. That's the piece that I'd pause you on a little bit though, because those friends aren't really friends. Yeah. 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 But I mean, but we need to call it what it is because otherwise people will think like, Oh, I have to leave my friends. No, you have to leave the fake people that have been in your life that you've grown used to thinking that that's actually true friendship. And you've actually devalued yourself and the concept of friendship based on the false and then the fake relationships that you've had with other people. Yeah. And I think that like, that's that's such an important point. And that's, that's a place where I think she was able to see later on when she started forming real friendships, Mm -hmm. you know, when she was separate from this and was starting to form real friendships. But I think when you're in it and it's this idea or this feeling of, I need to leave everything, Mm -hmm. you know, because it feels so real. And so when you work with people on how to leave and they do have this extra element of having to leave the church and having to leave their community, how do you help them see that it's still the best choice for them to walk Mm -hmm. away and that they're not creating a big sin, that they deserve to live a happy life with somebody who respects them and cares for them? Right. So 
do you want me to answer it on like in general or specifically like the niche of like the church aspect i think um i think the niche of the church yeah okay so like a piece of that and i'll kind of touch on the one point that we didn't talk about which is the whole like divorce piece because that's like a big yeah. piece of like you know why well, i can't leave because i can't get divorced and and all that kind of stuff and it goes off this concept of like obligation of like you have to be obliged to be with this person forever no matter how they treat you no matter how they respond to you and people use like different quotes and different verses about you know hey like you can't get divorced like you can't actually like break up with someone like you have to all this kind of stuff and like in the bible and in like old testament there is actually a time when they were telling people to actually give the other person the certificate of divorce like actually like hey like you need to divorce this person. And the reason why is it was actually meant at that time to protect the women. Because what was happening was, we'll just call him a narcissist to make it easy. Mm -hmm. The narcissist at that time was being like, hey, I don't want you anymore, but I'm not going to actually divorce you. I'm going to go be with someone else. And because you're still legally bound to me, I can call you back whenever I want. So basically have my cake and eat it too. And you're stuck legally, even though I can go cheat on you. And you know, still have you in my life. Sounds familiar today, right? Yeah. And so this aspect of like, it was told in like Old Testament, like, hey, you need to actually like provide a certificate of divorce, like meaning like you actually need to finalize this because you can't just be with someone and then continue dragging them back into your life all the time. Like yeah. this is unacceptable. And so people don't realize different pieces of that, of how society has changed and how different things have happened. Like, yes, narcissists are in the Bible. Yes, narcissism was back then. Is it different? Yeah, absolutely. Because like we also didn't have a lot of society pushing this. Like society and families and broken families and all this stuff is already pushing narcissism in general. We see it everywhere. And so it was there, but it was different. It wasn't the same and it wasn't the same lifestyle. Like there's a million things that were different. And the thing to like understand is like when people are struggling getting out of a relationship that's a quote unquote Christian relationship or in a Christian organization and things like that they're still struggling to coming to terms with what it actually is of how it's actually being unloving of how it's being abusive and how we actually have to walk people through getting to that aspect of truth. Cause people are stuck in that fog, the fear, the obligation and guilt that keeps them stuck with a toxic person with a narcissist. So it's actually walking through and being like, Hey, did you know that your relationship with your husband is supposed to be a reflection of Christ and Christ doesn't abuse. He's not going around abusing other people. And so that person that is in your life that's abusing you is actually not even fulfilling even remotely a piece of the bargain that they said that they were going to do when they said those vows to you. And so that means you made a commitment, but they're not even holding up that commitment. And they're the ones that are being abusive and toxic. And that's not a relationship that you need to be in because it's not demonstrated through scripture or through God or through anything like that saying, hey, continue to be abused because that's just your duty. It's nowhere yeah. in the Bible. It's not even yeah. there. And so like, there's, there's this big aspect of really helping people get to the truth because ultimately it's not as much of people being like, I don't want to leave because of this in particular. It's more or less like them coming to terms with the story that they believe is yeah. they believe one thing that's not true. Like they believe that their husband loves them while they're still cheating on them. Like they believe that it's right for them to stay in the relationship because the husband says that versus like the truth of like, wait, they actually don't demonstrate it. So there's not even like their whole grounding of their argument. It doesn't even base on anything because they're not even loving to start off with. And so like the whole goal of raw motivations as we partner with people with our challenges and with coaching and trying to help people walk through is like a systematic process of walking people towards truth. And that's like mm -hmm. their truth and like understanding the truth of the situation, because the truth is the only thing that will set people free. Because we see people out of a relationship. We see people that have physically moved. We see people that have learned and studied for years about narcissism and still are not free mentally and emotionally. Yeah. Because until they actually learn that the story that they're believing is oftentimes built on a bed of lies from the narcissist and their own stories that they put on top of the situation to survive or to cope or to get through until they realize that and start to change those stories to actually be to the truth, they're never going to get free. And unfortunately, we'll meet with people that have been away, no contact with narcissists for two, three, four years. 
and they're no better off than when they were with them just because mentally and emotionally, they're still ruminating. They're still destroyed inside. Their confidence level is still gone. Their self-esteem is still broken beyond belief, and they're not able to get out because of the story that they're telling themselves. So ultimately, we try to help walk people through the story they believe to be able to get to the facts, to be able to get to the truth of the story that they should believe based on reality, not on a different version of reality that a lot of times they get ascribed to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You framed it differently, but it says the same thing that I say all the time is like the first step is to get right with the reality of like what you are experiencing and like what the truth really is, which does take Mm -hmm. time and like mental clarity to be able to see and also the willingness and the, uh, you know, the level of honesty that you can have with yourself to really look at your relationship and say, this is not love. Mm -hmm. Like, I know this is not love and this is what's happening. And I'm committed to that truth. Right. Thank you so much for joining me, unpacking this very complex topic. I feel like I learned a ton and I'm so glad that you shared all of this with us. I think that this really unpacks, there's a lot of complexity within Mm -hmm. the church. Can you tell us how people can find you, where your offerings are and what your social media handles are? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me on all social media platforms under Raw Motivations, R-A-W Motivations. You can find us on any of the platforms. I think we're on like seven now, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe eight. I'm not sure. So Raw Motivations on all platforms. Just type that in. You can also talk to me one-on-one by going to rawmotivations.com. Or if you want to start your healing journey and start to get an idea of what is narcissism, what's actually going on? Like, is it me? Is it him? Like, what's actually happening? You can start that journey at Escape Toxicity. Dot com and be able to start our seven day challenge to actually help you walk through some of the concepts, some of the hard truths that you need to be able to hear to be able to start your journey to break free. We've tried to start building challenges and things that actually go with you step by step to be able to help you partner with other survivors and to help mm-hmm. teach you through a systematic process of how to get free. And it's really cool. We've been seeing a ton of growth from the people that have been going through these challenges because they're seeing it on a day-to-day basis. And they're stepping through. I actually had a conversation earlier with a a client of mine who's going through our Clarity Challenge currently. And she's in our Thriver community. And she's moving through it. And she's like, it's crazy because each day, it feels like it's exactly what I needed that day. And she's like, I can feel like each day, it like being like the next layer that I need to strengthen to bolster my resolve of leaving, of making sure that I'm safe getting out, of making sure I don't go back, et cetera, et cetera. So we're seeing a lot of progress just with that like really like nitty gritty, like systematic approach, helping people move forward. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. I will put all of your links in the show notes, but I love that idea that like every day receiving something that just feels like, oh, that is exactly what I needed to hear. Because then you'll know Mm -hmm. you'll wake up the next day with that one piece of motivation that it likely will be exactly what you need to hear because that's where your mind is. Exactly. You believe that that will be. So thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. It was amazing. I'm really glad. 